Welcome to this video on statistical mechanics. I'm Jos Steysen and I've made a series of videos on the topic for my students in the course that I teach at the Technical University of Duft. In this movie I want to discuss polymers. Polymers are very complicated, can be very complicated, string-like molecules and we view them usually as beads on a string in physics because we, want to, we, we like to simplify or the chemistry a little bit so that we can make certain statements and especially we are interested in universal characteristics of polymers. And uh, to that end we throw away lots of interactions and in this movie I'm going to make life very simple. I will focus on the freely jointed chain and also on the Gaussian chain and the two, as it will turn out in the movie, um, they are strongly related and they also have related relations to the random walk problem. I hope you enjoy this movie. In everyday life we frequently encounter substances where, in which polymers play a very important role. And a good example is a mayonnaise sauce. If you prepare it well, it has a very nice smooth structure which is caused by the proteins that are long polymers and uh, they are embedded in oil. Polymers are also responsible for the slimy structure of this substance that you can make yourself in order to scare your friends. If we zoom in on the atomic scale, then we see that polymers have a very complicated structure mm -hmm. and uh, often very small differences in that structure are responsible for a large difference in the action. This is a polymer which is hyperin, which is a blood thinner, and you can indeed see how complicated the structure is at the microscopic scale, and you see that it also occurs in two, two shapes. And uh, minute differences in this shape can cause uh, huge differences in how these polymers act in life systems. However, in this movie and also in subsequent movies I intend to make, I want to f focus on the statistical properties of, um, of polymers, on the structural properties, without going into the chemical details. And therefore we make simple models which capture the features of the polymers and to try to infer the, the properties from such a simple model. In fact, we can infer a few important properties by treating a polymer just as a chain of beads, like is depicted here. Now, this is a two-dimensional, perhaps you can also view it as a three-dimensional one. But the idea is always that we have a, a series of beads, uh, like this guy here. And these beads are connected by links. And to use the following notation, we denote the beats by the vectors capital R. And this is beat number I. This is the next beat, I plus one. And the link connecting the two beats, I and I plus one, is denoted as the vector small Ri, lowercase ri. There are obviously many forces that could act between two beats, or between three or four beats. The simplest one is the one which controls the length of the links. So we call this length of a link, we call that L. And if we assume that the L can vary, it will have some preferred length. And so we could describe that by a potential energy, which is V stretch. And that would have a form like uh, kappa over two, and then L minus L zero, which is the rest length, that's the favorite length, because that minimizes the energy if L is, e L is equal to L zero. And this imagines the beads to be connected by a spring. The second type of interaction is the bending interaction, which is expressed as a function of the angle theta between two successive links connecting three beads. And if we assume that the beads want to be aligned, that that is the preferential situation, then we can write this as gamma cosine theta, 
which gives us the lowest value when theta is indeed pi. And of course, you can vary this by uh, subtracting a theta zero from this. That will give you a different preferential angle. You can also add a few other cosines of two theta, three theta, etc., to modify this. Finally, we have the dihedral or the torsional interaction, which we can define for four successive beats. The first three of these lie in a plane, that's this plane over here. The last three also define a plane, and that's this plane. And these two planes, as you can see in this picture, they make an angle. They have an angle, and that angle is chi. And the torsional or dihedral interaction is expressed in terms of this angle chi. And if we assume that the uh, chi uh, preferentially will be zero, then we can uh, write this as a minus lambda cosine chi. And if we want to have a second local minimum in the interaction for pi, then we could add a smaller lambda 2 with a cosine of 2 chi, and so on. This last interaction will have something like this shape. So we have minimum for chi is zero, and there is a metastable state, a second minimum for chi equal to pi. In addition to the interactions that we have encountered, there may be additional interactions. For example, these two beads may attract each other, and if they get too close, they start overlapping and they will repel each other. For such interactions, we have already a potential, that's the Lennard-Jones potential, it's depicted here, and it describes a, an attractive well when the particles are still at some distance apart, and there is a dispersion interaction which uh, decays like 1 over r to the sixth. And then there is a repulsion, which in the Lennard-Jones potential has a form uh, 1 over r to the power 12, and that describes the uh, unwillingness of two beats to overlap. They repel each other when they start overlapping. In the sequel of this movie, we will assume that the stretch interaction is very strong, which means that a k is a very, the kappa here is a very large number. And if kappa is a very large number, then L will always be extremely close to L0. In fact, we don't call it L0, we call it A. So we assume that the distance between successive links is always fixed, and it's fixed at A, at a length A. We start with a few definitions. So the capital R vector sub i denotes the position of one of the beats, of beat number i, and r i, little r i, is the link. We have seen that already in the previous picture here. The r i's are the positions and the r i vector is a link. And what is very important is that we realize that the norm the length of this ri, the length of a link, it's fixed at a distance a. Then we define gij, which is 1 over a squared, and then the expectation value of the dot product between ri and rj. And this is the so-called correlation function. It's the correlation function for the orientations of the links. And what we expect is that if there is no bending interaction, there is no dihedral interaction, then this will decay very quickly. And if the bending interaction is very strong, then this will decay very slowly. But because the chain is essentially one-dimensional, there is always an exponential decay that we expect for this gij. So we expect this to decay like e to the power minus i minus j divided by some correlation length xi measured in units of the chain. In fact, we have included here a 1 over a squared in order to have something which does not depend on the length. It has no dimension. So this is just the cosine of the angle between link i and link j. The expectation value here denotes an average over all the possible configurations of the chain. 
and provided we have a low temperature then we weigh very strongly the low energy configurations if that's if it's high temperature then all the configurations are weighed uh, equally the center of mass of a chain is defined as follows 1 over n plus 1 and then i running from 0 to n of ri which means that uh, i is always running from 0 to n so we have n plus 1 beats And the fact that we have n plus 1 beats implies that we have just n links. Finally, we define the radius of gyration. And that's this object here. And it is defined as the root mean square of the distance of each beat to the center of mass. And because we have n plus 1 beats, we divide by n plus 1 to get the average. Obviously, this is a very important quantity. It tells you how big the uh, polymer in the end will be. If it's curled up, it will be much smaller than when it's really stretched. Next, we define the radius of gyration, which is the mean square average of the distance between the beats and the center of mass radius of gyration. Obviously this is an important quantity if the polymer would be curled up the radius of gyration would be rather small whereas if the polymer would be stretched so each link would have the same direction then this uh, would scale with uh, the length of the polymer so it would, would scale with n. Finally we have the end the end to end distance which is the distance between the last and the first beat of the chain and obviously that we expect that to be related to the radius of a gyration again if the polymer would could be curled up then the last beat is likely to be close to the first beat if it's stretched then it's far away one of the most important properties that we can uh, assign to a chain to a polymer is whether it's curled up or stretched and that's expressed in a certain value of the radius of gyration and or the end-to-end -end distance and so we try to find this property that distance and we do that for a very simple model and that's the free chain and the free chain is defined as follows we have two beats the distance between the two between the centers of the two beats is a and the beats in fact i've drawn them here as finite circles but they don't have any size uh, they just have a distance a that's fixed and every polymer which has just these distances a between two successive beats is accepted it has the same energy let's call it zero as soon as the chain uh, has a link which deviates in length from a then the energy becomes infinite so we have either an infinite energy or we have a zero energy we could even have this link being bent back so that we would have the two beats like this almost overlapping uh, even that doesn't count we don't take that interaction into account so it's not a very realistic although in high dimensions uh, the effect that uh, the beats do not want to overlap place uh, not a very strong role so let's look at the properties of the free chain and before we consider those properties it's important to realize that because the energy is either infinite or it's zero uh, the temperature doesn't matter in this case if you think of a boltzmann weight e to the power minus beta e if the E is either zero or it's infinite, then obviously the value of beta uh, doesn't play any role provided it's finite. So for every finite temperature in this case, we have to sum over all the accepted configurations and all the accepted configurations are the ones in which the links have a length A. We focus on the end-to-end -end distance. That's the position of the last beat minus that of the first beat. So it's the distance between the last and the first beat. And we are going to evaluate that as follows. We just copy this expression, but we insert many uh, contributions that we add and subtract. So we uh, subtract first the position of the n minus one beat, and then we add that position again. And so we do the same for the n minus two beat and the n minus two beat, it's again 
add it. And then we end up with minus R1 and plus R1. So we haven't changed the expression here when going to the right hand side because every R that we have added, we have also subtracted. But now we have the advantage that we can uh, recognize here the R n minus 1 and this will be the r n minus 2 because here the next term is minus r n minus 2 and here we have finally r 0. If we worked out, out now this product we see that we can write it as a double sum over two indices i and j both running from 0 to n minus 1 because uh, we are now talking about the links. And then we have the inner product between link number i and link number j. But this expectation value of ri dot rj, we have seen that already before. We have defined that to be the correlation function. So we can polish this expression a little bit. We can write it as a squared times gij. And now we realize the following. If we have two links that are not identical, so we have an ri dot rj, where i is not equal to j, then because the only constraint on the chain was that the length of the, of the, uh, of the links was constant, a, but the orientation is completely random, and therefore this should vanish. So the only, ex only terms that we keep in this expressions are the ones for which i is equal to j. So we are left with only the gii's and we recall the definition of the gii that was 1 over a squared and then we have the expectation value of ri dot ri so that's ri squared and because the length of the links was a, our i squared is a squared, cancels against this one, so the gii is one, and we can immediately work out the sum, which gives us n times a squared. And so the conclusion is that the end-to-end -end distance squared is linear, scales linearly with the length of the chain, with the number of beats in the chain. And that's not surprising because what we have done here is we have described a random walk. If you would make random steps of fixed size a, then we know that the distance you travel is proportional to the square root of the number of steps you have taken. And indeed, if we calculate s, we find that it's proportional to the square root of n. So that's reminiscent of the random walk. We now turn to the radius of gyration, which we also analyze for the free chain or the freely jointed chain as it is sometimes called. And we expect this uh, radius of gyration to have a behavior, a dependence on n, which is similar to that of the end to end distance. And if we write out the R CM, the center of mass position, as the sum over all the positions divided by 1 over n divided by n plus 1, we obtain this expression. And the next step is to work out the uh, term in parentheses with a square, and the sum over i is 0. So not yet taking this expectation value into account. So this is the expression that I'm going to consider, the sum over i, and then we have here the term in parentheses with the square. And if I work out the square, I obtain the following. First, I have an i 0 to n, and then a sum over the r i squared. Then I have minus 2 divided by n plus 1. ri dot, and that is still under the sum, 
and then we have a sum over j running from 0 to n rj and finally we have we have the factor 1 over n plus 1 squared and then a sum over j and k both running from 0 to n rj dot rk and that last term also has the sum over i in front of it. Now I copy these three terms over here. So the first term is unchanged. The second one is also unchanged. And in the last term, I have to use the fact that this sum here does no longer depend on ri. It contains no i dependence, but there is a sum over i is 0 to n in front of it. So I'm left with a 1 over n plus 1, because I have this term n plus 1 times due to the sum over i. And therefore, I see that I have two terms with a 1 over n plus 1 in front of it. This term has a minus 2, this one has a plus 1. But apart from that, they are exactly identical. So if I would change the uh, summation variable i, the summation index i, into a k, this term is exactly the same as that term. And so in the end, I'm left with i is 0 to n ri squared minus 1 over n plus 1 ri. Now I can restore here the sum acting also over this part. And that's it. This last expression can be written in this form. I have now a sum over i and over j, both running from 0 to n. So if I take the term with ri squared here, uh, I get that same term n plus 1 times due to the sum over j. And we see then that I have this term up to a factor of 1 half. Also, if I take the rj square term, that's of course identical to this one, so I have the other half of this first term. Then if I take the cross product, so 2 times ri dot rj, and that cancels then against uh, this factor of 2, and there is the n, n plus 1, I see that I end up with the second term here. So we see that indeed these two terms are identical. So if I take that last form, which is this term, and I use it in this expression, it is immediately clear that I can write, you see, you need just an 1 over n plus 1 in addition to the one that was already there. So that is now an n plus 1 squared. And we need to take the expectation value of this term. And therefore, this is the new expression for the radius of gyration squared. Now we re rewrite this expression as follows. Here we have possibility that i is smaller than j or it can be larger than j. Uh, obviously the two give, uh, if we swap i and j, we have the same contribution because this term is symmetric under reversal or swapping i and j. Therefore, we can just focus on the terms where j is smaller than i and they give exactly the same contributions as the other way around. And if we take only half of the contributions here in the sum, we need to multiply by 2, so we get rid of this factor of 2 in the denominator. And then we can write the term here as ri. It should be ri minus rj, but we subtract ri minus 1, just as before. And then we add this term again, r i minus 1, and then minus r i minus 2, etc., etc., until we end up with plus 
rj plus 1 minus rj. And then there should be a squared. Obviously, these terms cancel, these terms cancel, and only the last and the first one survive in the end. But we recognize here the link vector r, little r, i minus 1. Here we have little r, i minus 2. And then we end with little r, j. Now we realize that, uh, as we had seen before, because we have a freely joined chain, uh, when we take the inner product of two uh, different links, then this it always gives zero, except when the links are equal, we get a finite contribution and that will be a squared. So we can replay, if we work out this product, we get products between all these are k's and are l's, and the only products that survive are the ones in which we have a product of r, k with itself. And then we can immediately write up the result coming from this expression. We count all the terms with an r, and there are i minus j of them, and each one gives a contribution of a squared, so this is the final result. Now the question is how we can evaluate this expression and in fact we realized ourselves that we are interested in the result for n is large and therefore we assume that we can approximate the result by replacing the sums by integrals. So that means that we have the same prefactor n plus 1 squared and then we use for, instead of i, we use an index x. Instead of j, we use an index y. And then we have a dx running from 1 to n. And then we have an integral of y running from 0 to x. You can also put x, is, x minus 1 if you want to be uh, very precise, but in the end it doesn't really matter. And then we have a squared times x minus y dy. So we first evaluate the integral over the y, put in the boundaries, and then we evaluate the integral over x. And here I've done that. In front of the integral we have the a squared divided by the n plus 1 squared. And then I have evaluated the integral over y, which gives me an x times y minus a half y squared. I substitute the boundaries, and then I'm left with this straightforward integral, which up to the prefactor is just an integral of half times x squared, which gives me an x to the third divided by 6. Now I have to substitute the boundaries, and in fact we are only interested in the dominant behavior when n gets large, so only the upper uh, bound is necessary here. And what we then obtain is a squared times n to the third, and because n is large we can replace the n plus 1 here by an n squared and we end up with a squared n over 6. And so we see that the radius of gyration squared scales linearly with n, and that's the same as the end-to-end -end distance, although here we have an extra factor of 1 over 6, and that factor was just 1 in the case of the end-to-end -end distance. But what we recover is again a kind of diffusive uh, diffusive behavior, the behavior that is typical for a random walk. Now we consider the full probability distribution for the entire chain, and that probability distribution is the probability density that we find the first, the zeroth beat, beat number zero at r zero, beat number one at r one, and so on up to beat number n at position p uh, at position r n. Now, what is that for the freely joined chain? Well, first we have a product of delta functions for each link, because each link needs to have a fixed length a, so we require that the little ri is equal to a, and we enforce that by this delta function. 
Then of course we have uh, to normalize this. The probability density should be normalized. And if we sum over, if we integrate over all the positions for the RI, because for each link there is an arbitrary orientation, the link would uh, say run over a spherical surface with radius a, and the, sp the sphere surface of a radius a is 4 pi a squared, so we have to divide by that, just for normalizing this probability density. Now we should be able to find from this detailed probability distribution, for example the distribution of the end-to-end -end distance, which I've called PEN. And this is the probability density for the distance between the zeroth and the nth beat being equal to r. So here we have a delta function and it tells me that the vector running from r0 to rn should be the vector r, which is just some given vector. And that is evaluated by using this detailed probability density and integrating over all the positions. Well, not really all the positions. I do not integrate over the position of the first beat, R0. We keep that fixed and that's for reasons of translation and translational invariance. I can put the, 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 the first beat anywhere. It would be nice if you could find a closed expression for this end-to-end -end distance and indeed we can do that and then it turns out useful to uh, not calculate this, this uh, expression directly but first it's Fourier transform which is uh, defined as a PEN of K not of R and that means I start with the expression depending on R and I multiply by e to the power i k r, just as usual, usual. I integrate over all the r's and then I get this result. And now I need to substitute this expression for the p e n r into this expression. And we see that it contains a delta function which enables me to resolve this integral over r. That's always easy when there is a delta function. I just replace the r by r n minus r zero. And then I need to include all the other terms. So I put in the detailed expression for this Pn, which is given up here for the freely joined chain. So I have my prefactor, which is necessary for the normalization. And then I sum from i is 0 to n minus 1. And I have my delta functions. And here are all my positions. Those are all the beat positions, and it's inconvenient that I see here link vectors. Here there are beat positions, so we have to transform one into the other. And for this exponent term here, the rn minus r0, that's, we do that according to the method that we have already applied several times. If I add all the differences, I, what I end up with is just the end-to-end -end distance. So that is what happens here. Uh, this term is already given in term of the link vectors and I can replace the integral over all the beat positions by the integral over all the link vectors and that can I can do that because I fixed the position of r0 and uh, that means that this is equi it is equivalent to integrate over all the possible other beats except for r0 or to integrate over all the relative positions which are given by this, these small ri's. Now this integral at first sight looks quite complicated, but it turns out that it's much less complicated than, than it seems at uh, the first glance, because we can factorize this integral. We can write it as, let us first focus on the terms depending only on the r0, then we have an e to the power i k dot r zero we have one normalization factor for that integral and then we have a delta function for r zero minus a and we can integrate over the three r zero because we don't have any coupling of R0 with other terms. And so the second integral will be exactly the same, but then we replace the R0 by the R1. We 
we have a delta function and so on and so on. All these integrals have different integration variables, but that doesn't matter for the result. In the end, we have one type of integral and to raise that to the power n, and so it remains to evaluate this integral. And as you can see, it's just an integral over a surface of this uh, exponential factor. So let's evaluate that integral. Uh, we use polar coordinates. We take the z-axis to be along k. So we have an e to the power i k a cosine theta in the exponent. First of all, the uh, term r squared, the r that we have in the spherical coordinates. We, we need to replace the r by a, and then it cancels against this a squared. So here we have the 2 pi. Then we have an integration over the angle phi, and that gives me the 2 pi here and I'm left with an integral over the cosine theta of e to the power i k a cosine theta, and that's a simple integral, and the result is sine k a over k a. And that needs to be raised to the power n in order to find the end-to-end -end distance distribution. So we have p e n of k is sine k a over k, k a to the power n. And that's not the most convenient form in which we can find uh, concrete results. So we take the logarithm. When we take the logarithm, we have the following expression. The logarithm of p is n times the log of sine k a over k a. And we tailor expand that for the small k values because they determine the long range behavior. And that's what we are interested in. And so we take the Taylor expansion of the sine up to third order in Ka. We divide by Ka to obtain this argument of the logarithm and then taking the first order Taylor expansion for the logarithm, we find minus n k squared a squared over 6. Well, that's a simple enough expression for the logarithm of p. So that means that p itself has a Gaussian form as a function of k. And if we take the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, we recover a Gaussian in direct space. So here I take that inverse Fourier transform, which brings us from the pk, that was this uh, exponent here, this Gaussian as a function of k, and we Fourier transform it back according to the standard procedure, and the result is this prefactor, which is a normalization factor, and then we have <coughs> e to the power minus 3r squared over 2na squared, which tells us that the end-to-end -end difference distance um, is distributed around zero. I mean, this is symmetric, this expression, around zero, and that's what we expect because there's not a preference to go in any direction for the chain, so the average value should be zero. But then it's distributed around zero like a Gaussian, a Gaussian in three dimensions, and uh, we see that the typical radius of that Gaussian goes like n a squared. The radius squared of that Gaussian goes like n a squared, so again, we recover the random walk behavior. Any distance, any scale which characterizes the polymer scales as the square root of n. Here I've written that again. This term in the denominator that's proportional to the scale of the Gaussian, it's the width of the Gaussian, and we see that it's proportional to n a squared, the scale squared. You've just seen that the end-to-end -end distances for a freely jointed state chain are distributed according to a Gaussian. And that inspires us to look at a Gaussian chain. So consider a very, very long chain, maybe a freely jointed chain. So there are many, many uh, beats in here with very small links, short links in between. And now suppose I chop this chain into pieces, then these pieces by themselves may contain many, many beats. And therefore, if they would have be freely jointed, each individual beat, then the end-to-end -end distance of such a segment would be Gaussian. And therefore, we can now also consider a Gaussian chain, which is built up from links, where each of the links has a Gaussian distribution. And it's interesting to see what we obtain then for the end-to-end -end distance and eventually the uh, radius of gyration. 
Here is the probability distribution for the Gaussian chain. As you can see, if I take two subsequent uh, posi beat positions, then they are distributed according to a Gaussian. And the total probability distribution is a product over all these Gaussians, since there is a sum in the exponent. There is a seemingly weird pro prefactor, which is 3 over 2, but that is just inspired by the uh, and distribution that we just obtained for the freely jointed chain. So let's look back at that. Here you see also the 3 over 2. So you can consider it now as just a conventional prefactor. Furthermore, what is important is that we include also the R0 here. We, if we normalize it, we, we sum, in fact, we integrate over all the Rs, including the R0, which mean that, it means that if we put a polymer in a large volume, the R0 can be anywhere in that volume. And in order to normalize the distribution for this translation invariance, that we can put the R0 everywhere in the volume, we have included here an extra factor of 1 over V. It is important to realize that unlike the case of the freely jointed chain, we have now here, um, we could interpret this in fact as a this exponential as a Boltzmann factor, where this is a stretching energy between two subsequent links. And that means that the energy is no longer either infinity or zero. So if we interpret this as a Boltzmann factor, then, there, the, then this prefactor is related to the temperature. And in that case, we could, in fact, define a Hamiltonian in quotation marks as follows. So I just interpret this as a Boltzmann factor, and then I would have an extra factor of 1 over kBt, and then the Hamiltonian in quotation marks that I could write down is this one. Why in quotation marks? Because this Hamiltonian would depend on kBt. On the other hand, I could also assume that the A depends on uh, kBt, such that I get a uh, temperature independent factor here. And then you could uh, view this, uh, this Hamiltonian, this, this distribution, as a Boltzmann factor of a system where I have a stretch interaction. So you have a harmonic interaction uh, in the beat lengths. And then there would be really a, a physical 1 over kT in front of this. So there are two ways to, to view this uh, distribution. One is you could have a freely jointed chain, which obviously is temperature independent. And then I would arrive at such a uh, Hamiltonian, of course, where the temperature never plays any role. I could also start not from a freely jointed chain where the distance between successive links is fixed at A, but I could just have a stretch interaction. And then I could have indeed a term which is e to the power minus beta, and then a sum over all the links. And I would have something like a kappa over two times r i plus one minus r i, and that squared, which is obviously of the same form as this but it derives from a different reasoning uh, and therefore in one case the beta is somewhat artificial. In the case of stretch interactions it's really a physical temperature, 1 over kT. That doesn't really matter for the analysis of this uh, model but it's, it's, it's good to be aware of this. There is, however, something very peculiar about this Hamiltonian, because we see that the equilibrium distance between two successive links is zero. So that's really an anomaly when we want to interpret the Gaussian chain as a real physical interaction. Physicists are always fond of using Gaussians because you can do easy calculations with them, and it's no different in this case of the Gaussian chain. In fact, if we have a chain which consists of three beats, 0, 1, and 2, and we are interested in the, uh, well, this would be the end-to-end -end distance of that uh, small chain, so it's the probability to find R0 and R2. Well, if we want to find that, we need to integrate over R1. So this is the integral I have to calculate. I have to put the uh, probability density of the entire chain in the integral and I only integrate over R1. 
That's the central bead. And so that's in order to obtain the end-to-end -end distance between the zero and the two bead. And this is a straightforward three-dimensional Gaussian integral which can be carried out. And the result is again a Gaussian now between uh, depending on R2 minus R0. And what is uh, interesting is that the spring constant, if I interpret this as a spring, spring constant, if I add two springs, then it turns out that that turns into an effective spring constant, which is half the value of the original one. I have now here a 3 over 4a instead of 3 over 2a in front of the harmonic interaction. Now imagine that you have a very long chain and that the interactions are always uh, harmonic, just like in this case. The probability distribution is described by Gaussian. And what I could do is I could apply this procedure where I have summed over or integrated over the R1. Let's suppose that this one is number zero, this is two, so I have integrated over this guy. And then I can go to four, uh, integrate over number three. And so I can just eliminate half of the beats of the chain. And if I have done that, then I can eliminate for example, number two, number six, etc. So I can repeat that procedure. And that gives me then in the end a formula for the final end-to-end -end distance. Now in the example that I just gave, I, you see here there are five beads and I can uh, integrate over these two and then I can in integrate over this central one, the two, and I'm left with coupling between zero and four. And I can do that whenever the n is equal to 2 to the power m plus 1. So I can perform this m times. And each time that I do that, the actual spring constant is reduced by a factor of 2. And if I exploit that, I find that uh, in the end, I have an n to the n distance, which is given by the following Gaussian expression. Two n pi a squared, three halves, and then I have an e to the power minus three over two and a squared r n minus r zero squared. So that's the final result. We find that for a Gaussian chain, I always have a Gaussian distribution for the end-to-end -end distance. This is an end-to-end -end distance. That's the same as for a freely jointed chain. Also there we found a Gaussian distribution with an n here in the denominator. So when we see only the distribution of the end-to-end -end distances of two chains, it's impossible to tell what the details of the interactions are. In the end, all the chains will behave as Gaussian chains, and they will all have a end-to-end -end distance distribution like this. Time for a summary. Polymers are macromolecular chains, and we have used a simplified model in which the polymers are viewed as beads connected with links. And the interactions which involve the links and the beads can be either the stretch of the links, uh, we can have bending associated with three successive beads, torsion, which uh, is an interaction for four successive beads, and then each of the links or each of the beats interacts with each of the other beats through a Leonard Jones interaction. Now, all these interactions obviously are quite complicated, and we have studied a very sim strongly simplified model, which is the free chain, and then we neglect all the interactions except for the stretch, and we make that in infinitely strong, which means that the length of the links is fixed. So, all the links have, in fact, a length of A which cannot be changed, and then we can immediately write down the probability distribution for such a chain, uh, R0 to Rn are the positions of the beats, the Ri, lowercase r, form, they are the vectors associated with the links, and what this tells us, this delta function tells us that the length of the links should always be A. 
So that's the strong stretch interaction. We have calculated the end-to-end -end distance, which we called S, and that's proportional to the square root of N. So that's the same as we would expect for a random walk, and that's not surprising. We can also calculate the radius of gyration, which is a kind of effective radius of all the points uh, of which the uh, polymer is com composed. So it's the active radi the actual radi radius of the collection of points. And we also find there a proportionality with the square root of n. Now we have also calculated the probability of finding an end-to-end -end distance uh, r, which obviously only depends on the length of r because of the rotational symmetry. And it turns out that that is a Gaussian in 3D, which is centered at r is zero because it's not a preference for the polymer to go in a part any particular direction. And the width of that Gaussian is again proportional to the length of the polymer. We have seen that uh, if you study a free chain, you have this Gaussian dependence. You can also start from a Gaussian chain and then obviously you also arrive at a Gaussian distribution of the end-to-end -end distance. So from the end-to-end -to -end distance, you cannot tell whether you are dealing with a free chain or with a Gaussian chain. The Gaussian chain finally can be viewed as a chain with a stretching, stretching interaction because it's quadratic in the exponent and then it's a Boltzmann factor, so we have to include then a beta. And uh, the Gaussian chain int viewed as a chain with uh, stretching therefore has a real temperature dependence.